get out of the way, please. Everyone stay back there. Now stay back. Get someone to stop this thing. I can handle it. Hi, how are you? Welcome to Ward 13. Jim and I are uh, kibitzing here. We are back with uh, Professor Dave uh, Detmer. And uh, hello, Professor. How are you? Hi, John. I'm happy to be on the show again. Thanks for having me. We figured you should come back on because uh, with all my reminiscences of uh, Boston University, we didn't get much of a chance to talk, and I found some 38-year-old newspapers featuring uh, 
Paul, if you can. Well, we actually have the Paul. We have it. Uh, if you can put the uh, F when you get a chance up on, you know, just show the people. We've got October 6, 1980, Zinn Ellsberg, lead rally, protest draft. And there was a protest draft registration. I remember that, the draft registration. And there's John Hopwood. Because of a, our good friend Dave Colapinto gave me some bad advice before he became a big, big lawyer. <laughs> because uh, the CLA Forum, if you remember, College of Liberal Arts had 4,800 students. We were the biggest school. And we were, we were in a battle with Silver over the control of the monies. Because right. he was vetoing everything. We couldn't give the BU exposure, the... Uh, well, the progressive right, newspaper right, right. money. Uh, yeah. And uh, so we want, in the Senate, we only had two. And uh, I had a problem. The former president, who was, we were, the, we, were, we were the student party. Then there was the progressive student party, which we became part of. He wanted to be a senator. Another guy wanted to be senator, a third one. And I'm saying to my friend Dave, what should I do? John, is the one up you wanted? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Dave said, don't send anybody. So we boycotted it. It didn't work out very right. well. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> uh, what we wanted. just to make a little Manchester connection and all of you, think here you are, you know, for, uh, what is it, 30, f 30, 38 years 38 ago, years ago the on the front page of the Daily Press. And I was looking this week at, uh, we've have, we have, we um, have, it turns out that the valedictorian out of uh, Central uh, is at Harvard University oh, the, from this year, Declan Kneerum, and the valedictorian from Central the year before, uh, Aidan Ryan, is at, uh, is at uh, Harvard. And both of them are writing for the Crimson Tide. And oh, the Crimson, the Crimson, Harvard Crimson. Harvard Crimson, Crimson Tide Crimson. is Alabama. He was oh, sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, I'm getting my, you know, yeah. I have another glass of water. Um, no, sorry for the crimson. I'm sorry, the Harvard crimson. But anyway, uh, just as a kudos to them, both of them were have been um, their their writings have been featured um, in the last oh in the last month or so. But Aidan Ryan ended up, who's only a sophomore at Harvard, yeah. um, he ended up on CNN two weeks sure. ago as a, an interviewee. Uh, like, so when I looked, I was you know munching on my dinner, and I looked up at the screen, and there's the split screen with whoever the interviewer from CNN was, and I took, did a double take. Here's this young man of 19 from well, from Kavanaugh. Manchester um, doing his thing, and I'm thinking. You know, good for them. W you know, whatever, whatever their point. I don't even remember the point they were making. But the well, point it was is, about Kavanaugh. was it? Yeah. And they did get him banned. Uh, Dave, uh, Dave, were you interviewed by 60 Minutes when they did the thing on Silber? No, I was not. Because the BU exposure, some of the people were. I can't remember their names, although uh, <laughs> because of the third. I remember years. a guy named Paul was on there. I've forgotten oh. Paul's last name. Right, I can't remember. I remember he was on. And John Silber called them short, short pants communists. When 60 Minutes came to the campus, which was just roiling with all this stuff, and we said, oh, great, 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 great. But then Mike uh, uh, Wallace did a hit piece, well, on, B, on us, and right. Silver's a strong man for a strong time. And this strike that we talked about two weeks ago, it, it was national news. And, and uh, I remember Howard saying that his crew did not respect Mike Wallace, you could tell it, because he was that type of person. You know, he was a kind of an authoritarian type of person. Right. So he identified with Silber. And if you watch that famous movie uh, about uh, the whistleblower in the uh, R.J. Reynolds case, I can't remember what it was about, but it was about the 60 Minutes. Al Pacino was in it, an uh, Australian actor who got Oscar nominated. And they have uh, they they have Mike Wallace as a bit of a you know an insufferable buffoon. But, uh, you know, I, an interesting question for me is I, I look at you know I think about the history of activism on America's camp on campuses more generally, right. and uh, you know um, I, I I I wonder what has happened to the to the uh, sort of vim and vigor and and uh, and uh, dynamism well, you don't um, have how of, of uh, yeah but like like you know I, I mentioned two young men who just happened to come out of Manchester in the last 18 months but you know there are fine people in college unit campuses all across the country you're talking and about a law school professor Howard Zinn right. took us out uh, over uh, supporting a union right. did he not Dave Dave you there Yes, I am. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. Well, you were the class of 1980, so you weren't there when Jimmy Carter uh, implemented selective service. So m this uh, protest, the headline we have now is about that. So you had already graduated, 
but in the great BU strike, first it was the B, you know, the BU-5, the reason that Silber, Howard, Murray, Francis Fox Pivot, and two other professors would not cross the picket line of the clerical and the workers' unions, which was, I can only remember 65. Do you remember what the union was called? No, I sure don't. But uh, they stood up because... Because those people, those working class people, stood with them, and then they just went back to work, you know, and turned their back. But Howard Zinn wasn't like that, was he, Dave? No, he was not. And, and that was still going on when I was there. I remember the BU-5, yeah. um, and uh, <clears throat> I, I remember that uh, Howard Zinn was very funny in connection with it. I remember there was a, um, uh, a kind of a rally talking about it, and yes. Howard read from a letter that they had gotten from Silber, where it was threatening them, because as you point out, they didn't cross the picket line. Uh, Howard was teaching his classes off campus. Right, And right, Silber yeah. was trying to argue this was a fireable offense. And he said in the letter, uh, you know, there are going to be grave consequences of your actions that might include termination. Right. And then Howard's comment was, from this I can't tell if they plan to fire us, or kill us. <laughs> well, uh, since Howard Zinn wasn't, uh, didn't they give an award to Axel Springer of uh, that notorious uh, German right winger who led the anti communist crusade in West Germany? Uh, Volker Schlondorf made a film about uh, that where, you know, an innocent woman is accused of being, a you know, associated with like the Stasi and that. What was it called? The Lost Honor of Katrina Bloom. This was a guy like Rupert Murdoch, Axel Springer, right. who was far worse, you know, and yeah. uh, just this part of the Cold War machinery. So in a way, we, you know, it, people would go out on that too. But yeah, yeah. to... Uh, I, I was wrong. Two weeks ago, I said I helped organize the the BU five rally. It was this rally is the one I helped organize. I, yeah, because Daniel Ellsberg was there, and uh, and D. Howard Zinn. Yeah, but uh, one of the things, uh, uh, John, I, I, you know, when when uh, when the professor was on uh, last uh, week, um, you know, uh, we we I think one of the things we didn't do was at least I felt I didn't hear enough about the, his book. And, and right, uh, we are going. To I'd get love into to. Uh, I'd love to hear. You know, some That's more details. Back. Yeah, yeah. But I just want to point out a couple of things when you read the papers. See, when we're talking about Jimmy Carter, uh, on the page uh, where I get my first editorial, where they they call him pouting because I wa I wouldn't compromise. And then they started running these cartoons of me, Little Johnny Hopscotch. It was horrible. And, uh, <laughs> and then I have the union leader after me 30 some odd years later. Here's the thing. Here's Jimmy Carter in a tank. Right. How Jimmy Carter is using the military right. to get reelected. And, you know, there was a very strong so backlash against selective service in the draft. And one of the things, we, we gave money to send the bus down to the big Washington a rally mm -hmm. and got vetoed, but I let the money go through anyways. And uh, well, my regime was coming to an end because I was going to the graduate school early. But uh, and uh, yeah, it was it was a different time. I it guess it was. I guess I, I just wonder where that uh, where that uh, excitement or run excitement, no, where that activism you know has gone. As long as you don't, you know, people thought they might get drafted again. Now, as long as it's working class people having to kill men, women, and children so we can have the cheap oil. I guess it's for SUVs, it's fine. But uh, Professor Detmer, you did a little uh, talking about, you talked about Columbus, how these professors who have reacted against Howard Zinn would make claims that he wasn't a, uh, he wasn't a real scholar. Why don't you take over the narrative? Sure, yeah. Um, <coughs> so, when Mitch Daniels tried to uh, ban the teaching of a people's history of the United the States, the governor of Zinn, Indiana, in Indiana, uh, he when he got caught doing that because it, it it was in a bunch of emails he had sent privately that were later made pub public, uh, he tried to justify his actions by saying, "Well, there are a whole lot of uh, reputable scholars who agree that Howard Zinn's work is terrible," and so when I started reading the works of these people. I found that they made just outrageous errors. 
So I'll start off with this one just to give you a flavor of it. Can you just hold so up a second? Sean, just hold I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, Paul, could you go to, we'll, we'll, we'll use our primary background now, see. It's a uh, background with you and uh, your book, Xenophobia. Okay, take it away. Sure. So, Sean Wilentz, he is a very famous professor of history at uh, Princeton University, a prestigious Woodrow Ivy League school. And so he, uh, he said the following, this is a quote. Zinn had a very simplified view that everyone who was president was always a stinker, and every left winger was always great. That can't be true. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. You wouldn't know that from Howard Zinn. So I then went to a people's history and went to a chapter on the Civil War, and on the very first page of that book, which is page 171, we find the following statement, quote, It was Abraham Lincoln who freed the slaves. Also, uh, yeah, and also might add, uh, I don't think Howard had an animus against Franklin Roosevelt. He did one of his first books uh, on, the, uh, on the New Deal, New Deal Thought. That's correct. Yeah. So and here you've got this Princeton historian, you know, coming out right. and saying you, that Zinn has such a bias against U.S. presidents that he won't even admit Lincoln's role in freeing the slaves. And you go to the text, and there's a sentence saying exactly that. In my book, I've got literally over a hundred examples of this kind of just egregious errors in attacking, um, uh, in attacking Howard Zinn. Right. So uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, David Greenberg, he's a professor of history and of journalism at Rutgers University. And this is right out of the right-wing playbook. Anyone on the left, like Zinn, uh, from that era, if you want to slander them, you can accuse them of being a, some kind of Stalinist. Right, right, so exactly. We, we, yes. we find Greenberg saying the following. This is a quote. Zinn relentlessly criticized American policy and seems to have stayed silent about the Soviet Union. So in my book, uh, I've got a whole bunch of passages from Zinn about the Soviet Union. Right. So I'll just read you one example. Quote, The Soviet Union has been brutal in its treatment of its own citizens, murdering peasants in large numbers during the process of collectivization, imprisoning, torturing, and executing those it considered dissidents, whether ordinary people, intellectuals, artists, or distinguished leaders of the 1917 revolution. The term police state fits it very well. And he goes on to talk about it invading other countries, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Afghanistan, killing thousands of people. And in my book, I've got like about 20 quotes from Howard Zinn saying very critical things about the Soviet Union. Here you've got this professor writing an article saying, oh, Zinn, he had such a, an anti-American bias, he criticizes the U.S., and he was silent on the Soviet Union, when of course he was not. And so... I just got in my book a whole bunch of examples of people saying things, distinguished professors, yeah. which if you said them in a freshman level class, you'd get a bad grade for just making such outrageously and provably false claims. Can I just add something? A Stalinist meant in the context of times, because that's, I studied that and I still do, Stalinist means that you were under the party you're under the party discipline of, because uh, CPUSA was under the party discipline of Moscow, and, uh, uh oh, I'm saying Moscow, you know, I don't like that. <laughs> Moscow, and, Moscow, or Moskva. And, uh, Moskva. But they also would say that because he belonged, uh, I think, briefly, I don't, I'm not sure, to the American Labor Party, or Victor Marcantino, who was the f famous congressman from New York, which was part of a progressive movement. Oh, that proves he's a Stalinist, which it doesn't do in any way, shape, or form. You know, a lot of intellectuals, look at the, like Norman Mailer belonged to, I, he, I think he was a member of that too, and he was definitely no shape or form of a Stalinist. Right, right. And you had the progressive, uh, Henry Wallace, the progressive party of 1948. Right, right. Uh, I, I, you know, when I think about, uh, I know this is a, when I think about, uh, uh, you know, the, this, the discourse that we're having just here, the, thing you're, the things you're talking about, how people, uh, y y you know, f professors, uh, people who knew better and could have researched better, wrote things that were inaccurate about Howard Zinn. Um, 
and how appalling that we would find that, that learned people would do that, because the implication is they knew better, so they knew what they were saying was incorrect, right? But yes, but uh, I don't want to give away any uh, secrets, Professor Detmer, but I once thought uh, somebody that was, uh, when I was in California, uh, getting his master's degree at Stanford, even though he was at, uh, uh, at the Hoover Institute, even if he, he was a left-winger, because it was an excellent school, I helped teach him how to write because, you know, uh, an academic prose that was readable, you know, that was one of my fortes, editing and writing. Right. But uh, he, was, he, was writing, he was writing for a professor. I always saw one of the problems probably Doris uh, 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 Kearns, Kearns Goodwin yeah. had when they caught her with plagiarism and others because graduate students often write parts of the book. But right. still, you right. know, it's well, your. My, 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 my thing was sort of not to take cheap shots because sometimes, you know, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. It becomes too easy. But I think it's instead, you know, we've become uh, um, inured to it that, you know, we in the current political environment, we have a president who can say the exact opposite of what is palpably <laughs> true. And, and we can't even get a response from, you know, there doesn't seem to be any outrage about any of it. And so we find ourselves having conversations about how people mischaracterize the stance of someone like Howard Zinn, and we understand how important that is, but, you know, in, in today's b politics, we have congressional members, we have senators, uh, Senate and House leadership, and a president, all of whom, many of whom, are, um, treat the truth as an arbitrary sort of, you know, there is no such thing as truth. Right. But, you know, uh, and we'll go back to Professor Detmer. Uh, with, uh, with Murray Levin, who's also at BU, close yeah. friend of Howard, I uh, had both of them, they, they were sweet mates. The, what, the touchstone book for him was, was it Louis Hart's uh, The Liberal Tradition in America, that there's only one tradition, liberalism. There's no, re there's no actual reactionary philosophy in America. I mean, he, uh, Republican and Democrat, they all believe in capitalism. There's no labor right, party right, here. Right. The socialist movement was destroyed after there was... There was a lot of socialist mayors and a socialist movement. Eugene Debs pulled up some million votes in jail in 1920. Right, right. There's only one ideology, capitalism good, capitalism good, capitalism good. And then you characterize somebody like the Clintons who are center-right. Yeah. You know, when you use like a matrix and actually put people's right. opinions in they're center right. right. It's like Tony Blair was no left. This, you know, you yes, know. yes, yes. So what, how, what we're dealing with, and Professor Detmer, you can comment it, there's a one way of looking at America as it, from liberalism, which is a economic system and a way of looking at economics that's accepted. There's no other ideology. And that's peculiar to America, possibly because America is a unique country and that it started itself right, in the conditions right, right, it did. Right. There was no reactionary church here at the time, yeah. so you don't have the, the that that tradition which they had to face in Europe. And there's no disestablishmentarianism because they already had it when right, they were here. Right, right, right. But so you're dealing with somebody like Howard Zinn going back to the tradition, even Charles Beard, the economic interpretation of the Constitution, that the idea that the Constitution was put in place to keep a minority in power, which I absolutely believe in, and looking at our electoral college, a, a man that could only command like maybe 39 percent of the people, you can get elected. And, and a right. party, the Republicans that don't really represent a majority, can command things. And people just can't accept that. What do you think, Professor Detmer? Is that part of the reaction against Howard Zinn, that he falls outside well, the liberal could, tradition? It, uh, it could be part of it, although, uh, so let me say a couple things about that. I, I appreciate those comments. Let me just add a couple of things. I mean, uh, one thing that comes out of what you're saying is when, when Mitch Daniels gave that list of, of uh, scholars who rip into Howard Zinn, he always emphasized, oh, it's not just conservative Republicans like me. You've got right. scholars across the political spectrum who criticize Howard Zinn. But, you know, the, the spectrum of mainstream political thought, as you point out, is very, very narrow. In America. So, you know, these are people who are still within a certain framework. But then having said that, I think that still doesn't explain how they make these sub-freshman level errors. <laughs> 
that are just so easy to debunk. I mean, it's one thing to understand why they wouldn't like his political stance, right? but why they would make these errors, it's just astonishing. Can I offer you one more example, since Please. you mentioned Stanford? I've got one from a Stanford professor. I probably know. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. Sure, this, this is Sam Weinberg, and he is a professor of education who specializes in the teaching of history. And I gather he's sort of the leading figure in the nation on this, just really, really a very respected figure writing on the teaching of history. And he wrote an article a few years ago called Undue Certainty, where Howard Zinn's A People's History Fails, or so I forget the exact subtitle, but it's on Zinn, and it's called Undue Certainty. And so his big charge is, that Zinn is a dogmatist, that Zinn is just so certain of what he's saying that he doesn't consider sort of how he might be wrong. And one of the ways that Weinberg tries to document that is he says that, and now I'm going to quote, he says, a search in a people's history for qualifiers mostly comes up empty. Zinn's approach to history detests equivocation and extinguishes perhaps, maybe, might, and the most execrable of them all, on the other hand. So what I did to research this is I went online. There are a couple of websites where you can find a people's history online, so you can do a search for various words. So Weinberg says that Zinn extinguishes, perhaps, in my book, I list the 101 times that Zinn uses the word perhaps, in a people's yeah. history. It doesn't even and sound I point like... Out yeah. that words yeah. like seem, seems, and seemed, he uses 130 times, and I give the page numbers. And then just one more point, and then I'll finish this long speech I'm making. I then went through Weinberg's articles, and actually there are two articles by Weinberg where he makes this claim, and I looked up how often he uses the words perhaps and maybe on the, uh, and on the other hand uh, in, in making his criticisms of Zinn. And the answer is zero, 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 <laughs> zero, 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 zero. Except the one case where he does use those words is when he says that Zinn's failure to use them proves that he is a closed-minded dogmatist. <laughs> That's pretty wow. good. Well, yeah. So yeah. what? Uh, do you have any other examples? Oh, I could go all day long with examples. I just say that do, um, that what he that so, what he, Weinberg's saying uh, doesn't okay, sound like Hollywood. Here, here, here's yeah. a good one. Yeah. So Oscar Handlin, he was a big mucky muck professor of history at Harvard, Pulitzer Prize winner, um, and he wrote probably the harshest critique of Howard Zinn ever written. It was the review of a people's history published in The American Scholar, okay, and he American called Scholar. the book a deranged fairy tale. You know, just, he just really, really harsh words. And so at one point he says this, this is a quote, Zinn lavishes indiscriminate condemnation upon all the works of man. That is, <laughs> upon civilization, Sorry. a word he usually encloses in quotation marks. So before I get to my main refutation, I'm sure you guys are aware that Howard Zinn, in, his, in his, all of his books, including A People's History, he has lots and lots of positive things to say about the arts. He's constantly oh, yeah. quoting from novels and plays and songs and so on. So it's pretty ridiculous to say that he, quote, lavishes indiscriminate condemnation upon all the works of man. But at any rate, a clearly documentable claim is, says, the word civilization, he usually encloses that word in quotation marks. Well, once again, that's something I can do a search on, and I find that Zinn uses the word civilization in a people's history 20 times, and he puts it in quotation marks two times. So it's two out of 20, which is a far cry from usually. usually. And why does he put it in quotation marks? Because he's, uh, somebody is talking about like defending Christian civilization or... Creating yeah. a civilization by wiping right. out all the so natives. So when he does put it in quotation marks, it's, it's ironic. not because he has contempt for civilization. It's because he thinks, you know, people are claiming that something they're doing is civilized when it's really not. So he puts it in quotations because he's for civilization, not what they're doing. So that's that characterization that Handler makes is wrong. Also, in addition to the numerical one being wrong. Right, because Silber's coming uh, was educated in an age where. 
uh, the uh, white man's burden was still there, mm -hmm. that you're creating a civilization, a Protestant civilization. Remember Huntington's book, his last book, Samuel Huntington of Harvard, which I would have found flattering since I am a Protestant descended from the people that uh, w came here, like 1630 right. Plymouth Colony. I can take you down to the Litchfield Historical Society and show you the warrant given to my great, 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 great grandfather who relates me to Winston Churchill and Princess Diana. All right, I'm in royal who company. To fight the Indians and the French. And uh, this was our civilization and that, uh, and that melt they bought. We're going to make you into a simulacrum of us. Right, you could keep right. your religion, but you're going to learn la our language, and you're going to adopt our civilization. Mm -hmm. So maybe that, the irony of that. And, but that started becoming challenging in the 60s. And the, you know. so, so going back to the comments of uh, Professor, your comments, so, so these learned gentlemen who wrote these inaccurate uh, views uh, of uh, Howard Zinn. So what, what's the motive? I mean, is this uh, laziness academically? Was it for to promote a particular, their own agenda? Was it to meet, you know, the, 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 the acceptance of public publishers? I mean, why do you think that a person who is a recognized uh, leader of uh, education and education teaching at Stanford would choose to write such inaccuracies, and and his editors would choose to ignore it on checking. Well, you ask an excellent question, and uh, I, I wish I had an answer. I can offer a few speculations. Uh, first, let me mention that that in my book, I don't really talk about that very much because it would be speculative. Right. And on my book, I try to stick to things that I can really document and prove. But I'll right. offer a couple of speculations. So. Um, I suspect that what's happening is they what Howard Zinn is doing is so foreign to their way of looking at the world that they they it just looks nutty to them. They're not able they're not really able to understand what he's doing and so they don't have enough respect to really even check their claims. So like for example and mind and I want to repeat one more time, this is speculation. Okay. I'm not sure happened this way. But I'm thinking of Sean Wilentz. He probably, when he glanced at a people's history, he notices that it's got lots of criticisms of U.S. presidents, and he comes away with this sort of cartoonish view that, oh, it's this simplistic book where he's got nothing good to say about any U.S. president. And so he thinks of an example. Oh, you know, Lincoln, what's a good thing a U.S. president did? Lincoln freed the slaves. Oh, you know, you wouldn't learn that from Howard Zinn. And he doesn't have enough respect to actually then go to the text and see whether he's right about that. He just sort of puts it down. And right. the same thing with Sam Weinberg, the one who thinks that Zen is so dogmatic. I, I just It just floors me that some a scholar could assert, oh, he doesn't use these qualifying words, and then he doesn't bother to actually check whether that's true or not. But that's really kind of the only explanation I can come up with. And as for your second part about why do editors let them get away with it, I don't have a good answer on that one. That, that, that really bothers me. So like Weinberg, his original article was in a journal called American Educator, and then he put it in a chapter in a new book of his that's coming out with University of Chicago Press. And you know, if they were to just check his facts, the whole thing would fall apart, but evidently they're not doing that. Uh, Dave, is the American Scholar, isn't that published by Phi Beta Kappa or my yeah. ex? Yeah, yes, so is. that's Phi Beta Kappa because my ex used to get it. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. me. I didn't, I didn't make it. Uh, 385 you need. I have, I have a, here's my speculation. It came to me as Jim was asking you the question. When I went to uh, Boss University, I remember one of my friends, who's a close friend of mine, he's been on my show many times in the past was saying, oh, you know, I was supposed to go to Harvard, but uh, all you poor guys, and now the women are, are... Well, I think the women were still going to Radcliffe, but the integration of women into the Ivy Leagues was rather slow and painful. In fact, uh, when John Silver was trying to throw me out of BU, uh, I was protected by uh, a dean, Dean Betty, I can't remember her last name, but she had quit worked with Kingman Brewster at Yale. 
She had originally been the dean of women, women students at the University of Pennsylvania. Then Kingman Brewster brought her to Yale because they were going to put May, more women were coming to Yale. They weren't going to be a sister college. Mm -hmm. They were going to be mainstreamed because of the demand, the exigencies of feminism. And then uh, she went to work with Silver and she quit after a year. She used to always talk, you know, <laughs> she couldn't take it. But the great anxiety of that, suddenly you're having women and minorities you know, and when I talk about minorities, not, not like Jew, Jewish Americans or somebody mm -hmm. who had their own battles to become part of the mainstream and they were becoming part they were just getting mainstream in 1978 it was until Jimmy Carter let the first woman into a service academy but they was still had the, the 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 problems at Harvard that even who was the guy from the uh, Clinton administration that went to Harvard and then he was defending the lack of women in sciences that women can't do sciences. Oh yeah, yeah. And he got ousted from Harvard, but that would oh, have been Summers. Right. So Summers, right? Summers, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Th I would think that with this class of men and you know to be an Ivy League, you know, you're in an elite, you're in an elite and you have your card, you have the Harvard club, you have the Yale club, you get your tie and everything. And I'm sure, just like uh, in the intelligence community, you have to you keep it stamped to keep your security clearance or whatever, right. unless you're in the other organization then you're always in. But uh, well, let's, well, let's not talk about that. But uh, there must be a great deal of anxiety when you think about what's going on at Yale uh, a year or two ago with the African Americans who says, we don't feel safe here. And now at Dartmouth, there, there's been a, the intense reaction against what they're saying, sexism and favoritism towards men. There's just been a class action suit filed at Dartmouth. And what was Howard Zinn? We showed you the picture of him at Spelman, a Negro woman's college seg in the segregated South. Alice Walker was there, and she was, you know, loved Howard. He sent those, those uh, well, gals out to be part of the civil rights movement. He was an advisor to Stokely Carmichael and SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, until, you know, the baton Mike. was passed. So he was involved in a great cultural turmoil and promoting a diversity. That he, look at the, look, the problems we're having here in Manchester with diversity. Right. Uh, the, we have a fire department, 255 guys. Not one woman, not one, not one African American. And is Joe Lavasse says there's only one Hispanic guy. Yeah. And this is our, you know, let's not get into that today. Right. Right. I. I. Yeah. So I. I don't. And the you girls. And the. No, yeah. You, you, young. Uh, we have a problem getting uh, with racism <coughs> here in. Uh, Manchester, that people don't want to that people don't want to talk about. But I think that these elites, although they're liberals, and of course, you know, if you're some genius and everything, but we'll let you come in because there was always the tokenism of the '60s or '70s, right. and there must be a great deal of anxiety because and I'll, I'll, when I was at Berkeley, my, my ex was at Berkeley in the '90s. There was mm -hmm. a reaction to have more professors of color and, and that. And they actually offered buyouts to uh, a lot of the white uh, male professors. A lot of them went to the University of Texas. Uh, it, 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 was, it was a thing that Berkeley, that was in the 90s. We can talk about that at some other time because I'd have to lay the background on. Right. But can it be the anxiety of dealing with somebody with Howard Zinn who is committed to a, an inclusive society and you're dealing with these elites that, you know, I've had trouble with young people challenging me about what I believe, like the First Amendment, that well, you can't take the, right, well, the rights away from even these idiot Nazis and everything, because they always use the First Amendment to take your rights away. So, oh, this is, you know, the First Amendment is just bourgeois privilege and stuff. Right. And it's difficult to argue that type of stuff, because it's outside of a consensus that you were brought up in. Oh, my, my, go back to my earlier point, I'm wondering where these discussions are going on in the sort of, in the body politic today, and, but especially in academia. I mean, if there are wonderful conversations going, I, I just wonder how sort of the, how one reconciles where we are today as part of a national discourse, and by that I don't mean on CNN and MSNBC and Fox News. That, that sort of, we hear that all the time. But where, you know, the counterculture of the 60s, for instance, the, the Pete Seeger legacy, you know, even the Bob Dylan, Joan Baez but, legacy, where, where is that today? But, but, but Jim, 
Uh, Herbert Marcuse, one of the great, uh, uh, poli you know, political philosophers, was uh, Howard. He was a friend of Howard. He was going to come to BU, and Silber wouldn't let him. So he went to the University of San Diego instead. This is mm -hmm. one of the, the great, you know, a, a, a main, you know, one of the pillars of philosophy from the new school. Right. And Silber didn't want somebody like that at his university. Marcuse, a uh, one-dimensional man. So, so are, are you saying? So, are we saying that people are sort of manning the gates today? That that there that there's well, a barrier to entry. That if you have, I if you have, to, I'm not talking about. Yeah. I'm not talking about beyond the pale, sort of some kind of extreme, whatever way you want to describe that. I'm talking about other people's view of what they might describe as extreme we or something. The, I'm just talking about regular, regular. Reagan era, Joe. right? Yeah, I guess so, and that's what I'm trying to. Reagan I'm saying, like, how do we? Where? Where would does? You, would you think I would ever think of a Democrat talking about the things that they do now? When I, right. w I registered in 1977, a, a Democrat now. Look at the Democrats we have in here in New Hampshire. They're indistinguishable right. except on social issues. So I'm sort of abandoning with, 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 with any type of our, or beyond the Rockefeller right. Republic. So I'm, I'm I'm sort of abandoning them for a moment and say because we spend a lot of time. I mean you and I, with but people Indian generally Indian. spend a lot of time talking sort of you know on, on, in, in the political prism right. through the political prism in the political realm and uh, and our sort of our national discourse insofar as it's on television and there it's on no popular media. So so there's no intellectual so, class so, so, yeah, in so, the United well, States. That, that's what, Britain. What, what I'm trying to asking France. what I'm actually that's what, that's what I'm asking yeah. that's what I'm wondering right is like is like where is this discourse going on because I if it's happening in academia I don't see it on the, on, on the campuses of academia in other words through students and student bodies they seem to be mute well, I, well, and, and it, so Mr. Detmer what your uh, Mitchell as governor of Indiana wanted to ban Howard Zinn how is he as the head of uh, of your university He's the, is well, the, I have to specify, no. he, he's the president of the whole Purdue system, right. but he's not at my campus. I'm right. at one of the regional campuses, so we don't deal with him that much. But I will tell you, the general view is that he runs the place in a very top-down, authoritarian, totalitarian kind of way. Like sober. He, when he became president, he put out a statement that he's a strong believer in shared governance and any major decision affecting people's lives. There would have to be maximum consultation with faculty and students, but he doesn't act that way at all. He constantly will put out uh, these demands. This is what's going to happen, you know, when, when no one has been consulted. So that's, I think, sort of the general take on him. What about the support of research or professors' rights to, you know, to uh, go into any field they want once they have tenure? And what about tenure rights? Is that under pressure in academia now? I, oh, it definitely is, although they're going about it in a kind of backhanded way. Uh, it's not so much that people who have tenure are being attacked and having their tenure stripped from them. It's more that as the university goes the way of corporations, right. they're constantly trying to get rid of tenure lines right. and instead hire people on the cheap to teach as adjuncts. Yeah, so yeah, more yeah, yeah. as senior professors retire, their tenure track lines are not replaced and instead adjuncts are hired. And that not only saves money, but it also diminishes the power of the faculty, because one of the benefits of tenure is you have some job security, so you can criticize the administration without worrying about being fired. Not so with these adjuncts. They serve at the pleasure of the administration. They can be fired for any reason. But it also so that's kind yeah. of how they're doing it. That's how they're undermining the tenure system. But I mean, tenure also gives you a firewall against criticism if your research is uh, doesn't fall in favor. I can't remember, but I remember Silver fired a professor because he objected to her essay on uh, Rousseau and uh, her work on Rousseau and love. Which, if you yeah, know, Rousseau is, is, is was relative. One of my professors, absolutely. What was her yeah, name again? She went up for tenure. Right. I, I, if I remember correctly, she was supported by her colleagues and all of that, Senate. and Silber unilaterally turned it down. Right. So Silber, I think he is, an, or he was an outlier on that. Most, uh, you know, most tyrannical presidents don't go as far as he did. There was another case, maybe you'll remember this one, John. Uh, there was a case where a female English professor wrote a study of Jane Austen that won some national awards and was very favorably reviewed. 
and she was unanimously supported for tenure all the way up the line, all right. the faculty committees. And then Silber unilaterally turned it down, and he gave as his reason, quote, Jane Austen is not a major novelist. <laughs> yeah, can you so believe that? He then, because of the scholar then women. sued Silber yeah. and yeah. the university, and the courts are reluctant to intervene in things like that. Yes. Usually the university will win because the courts are conservative. They don't want to intervene. But here they were able to get Silber on the stand, and it was a big disaster. Like when he read uh, They got him to admit under oath he had never read this scholar's work. You know, the people who had recommended her for tenure had, but he who turned her down had not. And then also it was got into evidence that he had called the English department, quote, a goddamn matriarchy, when in fact they had something like five professors out of 30 were women. That's, that's true. enough in his mind to call it a matriarchy. The, so yeah. this scholar won the suit and got like a six-figure settlement against the university. Right, so we go back to Zen and now the misogyny of Silber. When I was studying, yeah. uh, well, I studied political science and literature, but the idea, a woman could not be a great writer. Then you find Virginia Woolf and other right, great right, writers, right, right. or just reading The Age of Innocence, Wharton and yeah, them. Right, yeah. and, but the, and the fault they're called, the pro China buck, a, a woman can't write and they can't be great poets or anything. The misogyny that existed and, and the arts, and the arts. But you, 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 you just horrible. used the, you yeah. sadly, you just used the past tense. I'm not sure that you, we should be using the past tense because we're seeing misogyny. You know where, where's you know things have changed around the edges, right? Yeah. I mean, ju just like with the advent of uh, with the advent of uh, Barack Obama to the presidency, we thought we were now going to be living in a post-racial uh, United States that sort of we cross cross some Rubicon into a new age, and it turns out no, we didn't. <laughs> we Actually, do it. we're going backwards. We, yeah, we just lifted the locomotive the, is coming back down. Yeah, the we track. lifted the stone up, and 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 the cockroaches ran in all directions. And when you look at uh, you know the real uh, well, well, advances have been made in terms of you know uh, uh, equality of the genders, etc. Yeah. Because of the civil rights, yeah. which will be will erode now. Right. right. There's no there's no question in my mind that you know we saw re today there's uh, Elizabeth Warren it sort of looks like angling for for uh, candidacy and all the rest of it. And when I whatever one feels about Elizabeth Warren, I think that the misogyny in 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 the uh, p p as part of the political discourse in the United States, I, I have no question in my mind. But it's it's harder for a, any woman, not because she'd be the first, but it's harder for any woman, regardless of party or anything else. The fact that your gender is female. Male, the yeah. barrier's higher, and you're going to be held to a different look standard. Canada has had a prime minister that was a woman, oh. although. Uh, but look at the hey. UK. You know, yeah. we had one of the uh, right. major ones. Well, we, well we sometimes the exception proves the rule, right. too, right? Thatcher, uh, so. That was how we've had we've got we've got me yeah well we when well, we had Indira Gandhi Golda Meir we've had you know Benazir yeah, Bhutto I mean there's been a uh, there, there, you know there's a there's a long history of uh, right. of, uh, but of, in of the United States roots. yeah right it's, right it's rather shocking well we're we're about a hundred years we've we've had the first woman in Congress for about a hundred years we're probably ready to take the next step but 1917 yeah yeah. Well, so that's why I say vote. 1970. She couldn't vote for president. 19, I think that was one of the progressive. So, so one as we come, the one other thing I was thinking. I, mean, I mentioned Pete Seeger earlier on. I, and when I think about sort of, I'm talking about like populist, oh, yeah. populist sort of regular stuff that's not in the ivory tower sort of stuff, right? Because I'm so for a minute here. I'm, I'm one, so as part of you know my. It's no secret I'm not a, a great uh, admirer of our of our current president. And and uh, but but I th so I'm wondering you know at what point since since our since our news media what Whatever it is, I don't want to be anti-media, but since the discussion is not going on Our there, media. when 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 will you think art, artists, uh, you know, sort of the popular media? When are we going to see it from? You know, we, we, maybe we'll see it in graffiti first. But at what point is poetry, prose, that's film? Over. That type, um, that's over. Uh, when, well, that's over. We live in a is post. It? Is it? Yeah. Is it? There's no, there's no, there's no Bob Dylan, and the, there's no, you know, there's no Guthrie, you know, uh, uh, no, the Woody Guthrie. The, there's no this land is your land. There's no, um, you know, turn, turn, turn. There's no like, not, we're not we going to get any of this. We have the triumph of mass marketing. Okay. All right, I'm just you know? asking the question because I actually expect in any in any th like for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, and so even if you know w what can be sanctioned by how whatever way, by markets or writer, by name, politics. Name a great writer now, like a novelist that's had an effect on this society in the way. It, uh, um, other oh, people, I, I, or, in, or a place like France, or like a Malraux or something. I wouldn't know where to start. Yeah, it just yeah. we don't I, have that culture. Everybody is in another place with these devices. 
You yeah, know? but devices are the democratization of information. No, but Jim, it rewires your brain Perhaps. into a different consciousness than we were br brought up in. Perhaps, That's but, if, a whole but if, you were, if you were singing a song, if you were writing something, if you were speaking yeah, something, and, 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 kill that and you couldn't, and, no, but, and you, but you couldn't, but, the, but you know, the, 50 the, years ago, the barrier to entry was you would need to at least get published somewhere. The president of the United States had Kanye West at his, uh, oh, yeah, with all of us talking about, you know, policy. Right. Well. This isn't, da uh, what was it, uh, Daniel Patrick Monaghan uh, in the Nixon administration writing uh, his famous uh, report on mm -hmm. the African-American family. Mm -hmm. This is, we're living in a reality TV show on cable, Jim. Academia, yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't, uh, you know, you don't have into public intellectuals in the United States. It used to be you could watch talk shows and you would have occasionally somebody on. There's, right, right. You, know, you don't have Norman Mailers or Gord Vidal's talking about real issues or politics or something. Right. People, they, you don't even have that on PBS. Yeah. But and go ahead. You know, a good example of that is how the mass media never has Noam Chomsky on. No, they never have. Yes. That's a great, that's a great example. On. That's a great example. Yeah. Was Howard ever on Bill Moyers? He might have been, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yes, I remember. Oh, no, sorry, I take that back. That was Chomsky who was on Bill Moyers. I okay. don't think Howard was on Bill Moyers. I, yeah. I, I worry about the, but you know, I'm going jumping around, but here's another, the, the monopolization or the sound a single point of entry for a lot of this stuff. So, and, and I, I don't ever want to get in, it's too easy to sort of, you know, get into these silly conversations about the, the yeah, media and all the rest of it. But, 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 but I think about in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of writing, and this is, you know, your area, Professor, as you've just uh, published this book but um, you know you've t today if Barnes and Noble doesn't want you where do you go how, how do you and get going out of business yeah but how do you get published you know years ago you know there was a market for multiple now, now well, there were gatekeepers like Scribner's uh, Farrah Strauss Giroux but but, they, but the gatekeepers are now down to one or two you know, they, yeah. they're, they're there used to be tw uh, in 1990. Somebody I got one of my friends is a literary agent. You can go to 24 houses. You go. To f then it became eight about 10 years ago. Now it's four. Right. All the imprints like Farrah, Strauss, which had its own editors, doesn't they're exist gone. anymore. Yeah, Jim. yeah, yeah. The, the 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 world we were brought up in doesn't exist. I'm uh, fine with that because the world I was brought up in wasn't perfect. Uh, you know, we didn't we didn't reach perfect. I mean, it got, was it, I it got close the day I was born. But I mean, that, after that, it was all downhill. But but, but uh, I don't believe that was perfect, right? But I, so so it's not as though I'm looking for the past. But or looking John, uh, we'll get back to John Silver said a university was a car factory and students were just cars, and he milked that school for. Uh, how much? Uh, uh, how much money do you think John Silberg took from BU in compensation? Everything well over like twelve, thirteen million dollars. Like yeah. his, his, his return back was six million. Yeah, that's chicken it was feeding. Just, that's see, chicken feeding today's money. Nothing could have happened with Silberg when he really started going bad. Is he took over the board of directors? Who was that? Arthur Metcalf, Dave. Remember? Yeah, I remember Arthur Metcalf. Yeah. And once he had the board of directors. He, the, the Senate would vote, you know, like the faculty Senate would vote against him. Yeah. And that would be unthinkable for the president to right. defy that. That wouldn't happen at Harvard. Under power Democrat. corrupts absolute, power right. corrupts absolutely, right? He, so what we lived actually in the vanguard of what came because schools are a car factory. And I go to like Bernie Sanders, with the kids of Bernie Sanders, and ye, four years old, the uh, Ron, Ron Paul, and they're all telling me that they're, they're in debt over $100,000. Oh. I'm thinking, geez, how could anybody be, but they can't. The uh, so, I I have uh, my so so. At, but who at, controls history, Dave? Because you'll be back next week. Yeah. Who controls history, Dave? Is that what we're fighting over? And does it matter well, anymore? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are you you all know all the cliches how the winners control history. Mm -hmm. um, uh, having said that, though, I mean, as cynical as I can be, I still was very surprised when I undertook this research project and saw how far these guys would go. I mean, yeah. I thought they probably would be unsympathetic to Zen and maybe not have the most charitable reading of Zen, but I had no idea that it would just be outright fabrication over and over and over and again. I still have trouble wrapping my mind around that. How much uh, press is your, is, is your book getting picked up? Are people talking about this? Uh, they are to some extent. One thing that really was a th uh, th there was a really nice review that was published at Counterpunch. So if you go to counterpunch.org oh, counterpunch. and was type Alex in Coleman. my name or the name of my book, you can find a nice review that came out. 
And Chomsky gave an interview to Matt Taibbi oh, around okay. the middle of September, and he brought it up and plugged the book. I was just thrilled to read that because he wasn't asked about it. He was. They were talking about his own book, Manufacturing Consent. Oh, one of the great books. And at books. a certain point, he said, oh, you know, the same kind of thing has happened to Howard Zinn, and there's this really good book that's come out recently called Xenophobia. You should check it out. And in that article, there's actually a link to the Amazon page on it. So it is getting a little bit of discussion, but one thing that has been a disappointment to me is that none of the historians I've criticized have responded okay. yet. So like Weinberg, um, I published um, an article online that uh, is sort of uh, adapted from my section on him in my book, where I accuse him of just all kinds of grotesque scholarly errors. And that article, it was originally published at howardzen.org, right, right. but it's been picked up by Counterpunch and History Network News, which is a, a website that historians go to. So I'm sure Weinberg must know about it by now. And I've been monitoring like his Twitter feed. He doesn't say anything about it. You know, I don't think he's going to respond. Well, Dave, we got to cut you off now. Uh, I'll talk about coming back, baby. You can come back election night, but you, I know you'll probably be celebrating our creation of a consensus. But we'll get you back in November. <laughs> and let's think about getting you out here and maybe Joel, uh, our, our friend from uh, Ottawa and stuff, have a little conference out here about this since we were part of the Xenophobia. Take care. And I'll contact you uh, soon. Nice speaking to you Thank again, you Professor. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Yeah. And, uh, well, Jim. Another next, night. Uh, tomorrow, uh, next week. Uh, Paul, can you put up our eye, our final background? You're welcome to spend the rest of uh, the month with me uh, uh, riding shotgun. Although sure. it might be a little hot, you know. Really? Will be like well, a stagecoach with stage uh, John Wayne. All right. Uh, well, we'll I see. Think that, we'll see. I think pa Paul's probably blushing in there They're when he thinks about my final background. Really? Yeah, because it, uh, next week, the case against Ted Gatsis, which oh, really? is on me, not you. Oh. Okay. And we'll go over uh, some of the some of the things. Uh, uh, w w we call him our, our, our favorite mayor. <laughs> as uh, Trump calls himself, your favorite, our favorite president. Right. I noticed that he uh, he refused to uh, debate. Uh, um, what's his name? Uh, China. Great Worth. China Worth, uh, yeah, He yeah, refused yeah. to debate him, but how can he? Yeah. How can he? How can he defend what? Well, what? if he believes in it, you know. I mean, I I, I always thought, you know, that that uh, he did what he did because he believed in it. And if you believe in he it, then you might might be ashamed of it. Just like stand up and defend it. Jim, he lied about the West High rape and. We can talk about if you join, and it'll be—it's on me. Yeah, and we'll put the disclaimers out too. But he lied about the West High rape, right. and, uh, and, uh, and, and we'll and go over that. I can't. Yeah. Uh, I will. I've already right to know uh, plenty. Right, if, right. If we'll see if Emily Rice gives it up, but she's required by law to do it. It's what happened is indefensible, and particularly in the current climate, how can he go out there? But Democrats, local Democrats. We'll, well talk about yeah. Washington, not here. Right. Hey, see you next uh, week, and uh, thank you, Paul. And uh, next week, the case right. against Ted Gatsis. Thank you, John. When are you coming back? Whenever it's time, Mom. Uh, don't seem right to leave an old lady alone. And what about my goddamn license? Oh, this is just... Why didn't you tell him you wear a glass? None of this goddamn business what I wear. Just wear them to read, anyway. Was there anything else? The time has come for us to say sayonara. My heart will always be yours for eternity Please promise that you'll be returning someday to me